the biggest issue I see with so-called AI experts is that they think they know more than they do, and it scares the hell out of me. This is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. AI is much more advanced than people realize, and the pace of progress is much greater than people realize. You know, it'd be fairly obvious if you saw a robot walking around talking and behaving like a person, you'd be like, whoa, that's like, what, what's that? You know, that would be really obvious. What's not obvious is a huge server bank in a dark vault somewhere with an intelligence that's potentially vastly greater than what a human mind can do. I mean, its eyes and ears would be everywhere. Every, every camera, every microphone, every device that's network accessible. That's what it, really what AI means. It's not like a robot running around. The robots would simply be, they'd be like a finger of, of the AI. In general, we are all much smarter than we think we are, but much less smart, dumber than we think we are, by a lot. So this, is, this tends to plague, plague smart people. They just can't, they, they define themselves by their intelligence, and they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking uh, situation. I'm really quite close to I'm very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI, and it scares the hell out of me. It's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows, and the rate of improvement is exponential. And you can see this in things like AlphaGo, which went from, in the span of maybe six to nine months, it went from being unable to beat even a reasonably good Go player, to then beating the European world champion who was ranked 600, then beating Lisa Dole, 4-5, who'd been world champion for many years, then beating the current world champion, then beating everyone while playing simultaneously. Then there was Alpha Zero, which crushed Alpha Go, 100 to zero. And Alpha Zero just learned by playing itself, it, it can play basically any game that you put the rules in for. If you, whatever rules you give it, just, it literally read the rules, play the game, and be superhuman for any game. Nobody expected that rate of improvement. If you ask those same experts who think AI is not progressing at the rate that I'm saying, I think you will find that their predictions for things like Go and other AI advancements have their, their batting average is quite weak. It's not good. We'll see this also with uh, self-driving. I think probably by end of next year, self-driving will be will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200 percent safer than a person by the end of next year. We're talking maybe 18 months from now. Uh, NHTSA did a study on Tesla's autopilot version 1, which is relatively primitive, and found that it was a 45% reduction in highway accidents. And that's despite Autopilot 1 being just version 1. Version 2, I think, will be at least two or three times better. That's the current version that's running right now. So the, the rate of improvement is really dramatic. Uh, we have to figure out some way to ensure that the advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. I think that's the single biggest existential crisis that we face, and the, and the most pressing one. And how do we do that? If we take it that it's inevitable at this point, that some version of AI is coming down the line, how do we steer through that? I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight. I mean, I think it, one should generally go on the side of minimizing those things. But this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. And therefore, there needs to be a public body has insight and then oversight to confirm that everyone is developing AI safely. This is extremely important. I think the danger of AI is much greater than the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. And nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Far. So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. Like, narrow AI is not a species-level risk. It will result in dislocation, in lost jobs, and sort of better weaponry and that kind of thing. But it is not a fundamental species-level risk, whereas digital superintelligence is. And so it's really all about laying the groundwork to make sure that if humanity collectively decides that creating digital superintelligence is the right move, then we should do so very, very carefully. This is the most important thing that we could possibly do. We're headed towards either superintelligence or civilization ending. Those are like the two things that are, that, that'll happen. Intelligence will keep advancing. The only thing that would prevent from advancing is something that puts civilization into stasis or destroys civilization. What is a world that would, we would like to be in where there is this 
digital superintelligence. And then another point that I think is really important to appreciate is that all of us already are cyborgs. So you have a machine extension of yourself in the form of your, your phone and your computer and all your applications. You are already superhuman. But by far, you have more power, more capability than the President of the United States had you know, 30 years ago. If you have an internet link, you have an oracle of wisdom, you can communicate to millions of people, you can communicate to the rest of Earth instantly. I mean, these are magical powers that didn't exist not that long ago. So everyone is already superhuman uh, and a cyborg. So what's going to happen is robots will be able to do everything better than us. Well, I mean, all of us, you know. This is really like the scariest problem to me, I tell you. I really think we need government regulation here, just to, you know, ensuring the public good is served. Because you've got companies that are racing, that they kind of have to race to build AI, or they're going to be made uncompetitive. Essentially, if your competitor is racing to build AI and you don't, they will crush you. You all need to really pause and make sure this is safe. And like, when it's cool and we're convinced, and the regulators are convinced that it's safe to proceed, then you can go. But otherwise, slow down. You kind of need the regulators to do that for, for all the teams in the game. I mean, there's like something like 12% of jobs are transport. Transport will be one of the first things to go fully autonomous. But when I say everything, like the robots will be able to do everything. Yeah, the analogy to a nuclear bomb is not exactly correct. It's not as though it's going to explode and create a mushroom cloud. It's more like if there were just a few people that had it, they would be able to be essentially the dictators of Earth. Whoever acquired it, and if it was limited to a small number of people, they were, and it was ultra smart, they would have dominion over Earth. So I think it's extremely important that it be widespread and that we solve the bandwidth issue. And if we do those things, then, then it will be tied to our consciousness, tied to our will, tied to the sum of individual human will, and everyone would have it, so it would be sort of still a relatively even playing field. In fact, it would be probably more egalitarian than today. Now, the thing that's gonna be tricky here is that it's gonna be very tempting to use AI as a weapon. It's gonna be very tempting, in fact, will be used as a weapon. So the on-ramp to serious AI, the danger is going to be more humans using it against each other, I think, most likely. That'll be the danger. Well, I mean, you could argue that, like, a company is essentially a cybernetic collective of people and machines. That's what a company is. There's different levels of complexity in the way these companies are formed. Is this sort of like a collective AI in the Google sort of search? We're all sort of plugged in as like, like nodes on the network, like leaves on a big tree, and we're all, we're all feeding this network without questions and answers. We're all collectively programming the AI. It feels like we are the biological bootloader for AI, effectively. We are building it. And then we're building progressively greater intelligence and the percentage of intelligence that is not human is increasing. And eventually, we will represent a very small percentage of intelligence. These things do play into each other a little bit, but what to do about mass unemployment? This is gonna be a massive social challenge. And I think ultimately we will have to have some kind of universal basic income. I don't think we're gonna have a choice. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. And I wanna be clear that these are not things that I think that I wish would happen, these are simply things that I think probably will happen. If my assessment is correct and they probably will happen, then we need to say what are we going to do about it? And I think some kind of a universal basic income is going to be necessary. Now, the output of goods and services will be extremely high. So with automation, there will come abundance. Almost everything will get very cheap. I think we'll just end up doing a universal basic income that's going to be necessary the harder challenge, much harder challenge, is how do people then have meaning? Like a lot of people, they derive their meaning from their employment. So if you're not needed, if there's not a need for your labor, what's the meaning? Do you have meaning? Do you feel useless? These are much harder problems to deal with. Do we even got? Elon Musk's personal views on God and religion are as astounding as they are controversial. Actor Rain asked the outspoken billionaire whether he had a spiritual life when he interviewed him. 
In his response, Musk ended up addressing the big question of whether God exists. Check it out. Do you have a spiritual life? Well, it sort of depends on what spiritual means. Uh -huh. I mean, there certainly are things that we, we don't understand about the universe. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less convinced that there's, say, um, some, some super consciousness watching over our every movement and kind of evaluating it against some criteria and deciding whether we're going to go to one place or another when we die. Mm -hmm. I think that's unlikely. Right. Rain continued to interview Musk on what he worships. From Elon Musk's response, it was clear that he was an agnostic, but not an atheist, as most people would think. As an agnostic, Musk neither believes nor disbelieves in God, since the existence of God cannot be proved. The physics guru only believes in facts and science. Listen to Musk's response in matters of worship. What do you worship? Well, I don't really worship anything, but I, I do devote myself to the advancement of humanity uh, using technology. And, and it does beg the question, if there is some super consciousness, or consciousness, where did the super consciousness come from? So I think the, the most likely explanation is uh, that uh, complexity evolved from simplicity. You know, that the simple elements over time combined to become more complex and mm -hmm. arrived at what we are. Mm -hmm. um, the tech genius made it clear in the interview that science and religion cannot coexist. The former economics student from University of Pennsylvania was probably borrowing from Karl Marx, a German economist who said that religion is the opium of the masses. The deeply religious reign was shocked to learn that Musk doesn't pray. Have a look. Can science and religion coexist? Probably not. Do you pray? I don't. I didn't even pray when I, when I almost died of malaria. Wow, that's really not praying. Right. So you put your money where you're... Bug spray was. Yeah. You're blowing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you deal with so much stuff. I mean, you do with space travel and energy and the source of consciousness, and you're thinking about all of these giant life's big questions. What blows your mind? What gives you awe? Well, I think that, I mean, the, the nature of the universe uh, gives me awe, and, the, and just the, the huge expanse of the, of the universe. And, uh, how far away things are and how big they are. And the fact that there are things like supermassive black holes that are equal to a billion suns. You know. What about dark matter? Doesn't that freak you out too? Uh, yeah, and dark, dark matter um, is also, I mean, uh, dark matter and dark energy are, are, are kind of interesting because I mean, I'm not sure what those actually are. You know, obviously people don't know what, what no, those actually right. are. And it's particularly dark energy. In fact, you know, th that may be an argument for this being a simulation. Because in a simulation, you, know, you can just make things be however you want. The, the laws don't all have to be consistent. Don't be deceived into believing that Musk is ignorant about religion. As a child, the boy Elon Musk attended an Anglican Sunday school and learned at a Jewish preschool. He probably knows more about the Bible and Christianity than most folks as seen in the following interview. Follow through. Okay, how many people have actually read the Bible? <laughs> Fewer than probably say they have, but... Oh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> Do you have I, to get I mean, at one point, I, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, I had this existential crisis and I was trying to figure out what's the meaning of life. And I was like, oh, it all means nothing. It's all, and, and, I, and I, you know, read like a whole bunch of religious books, including the Bible. And I'm like, there was a bunch of things in there they didn't teach you in Sunday school. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, dark. Um, yikes. <laughs> you know, God sure changes his mind uh, <laughs> from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I'm like, whoa, that's pretty vengeful in the Old Testament. <laughs> or maybe we can have a chapter past revelations. <laughs> but I, like, is there a happy ending here? Uh, like, uh, <laughs> um, Revelations part two, the happy ending? Uh, In the same interview, Musk was challenged as to whether he would accept Jesus as his personal savior. After evading the question for some time, Musk responded by saying that he would not mind being saved if Jesus has the powers to save. It would be quite a spectacle seeing Musk being baptized. We're wondering if you could do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> um, Personal Lord and Savior. It's a quick prayer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but hey, if um, you know, if if, if Jesus is, is uh, saving people, I mean, I, I I would stand in His way. You know, like they'll be sure. I'll be saved. Why not? Sweet, we did it. In the interview, Musk revealed that he accepted some of Jesus' teachings on love and forgiveness. However, the genius was quick to criticize how Jesus chose wine over water in a wedding. 
The interviewers were amazed at Elon's criticism on various biblical accounts. Have a look. I mean, let's just say, like, I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated. You know, there's some, some, there's great wisdom in what, in, in the te teachings of, of Jesus, uh, and I agree with those teachings. And things like turn the other cheek are, are very important because, as opposed to an eye for an eye, um, an eye for an eye leads everyone blind. So, forgiveness, you know, is important and um, treating people as you would wish to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Very important. And, and like, Jesus was obviously very pro alcohol, you know, because one of his miracles was turning water into wine. Yeah. And then it was like, they were having a party, they ran out of wine. <laughs> okay. And they're like, let's keep this banner going. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> who, 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 who can solve this problem? We're out of white cloths. <laughs> Friggin' stores closed. And Jesus is like, I gotcha. Okay. Water, now wine. I like, party on. Yeah. So, you know, accurate. Pro partying with alcohol is literally it's one of the miracles. It is interesting how the SpaceX CEO understands rocket science but does not understand the origin of life. The genius explained to Dr. Crystal Dilworth of the efforts that he has made to help understand the existential crisis during a late night chat at Canadian Consul's residence in Los Angeles. Here's what Elon had to say. I had this like existential crisis when I was a kid and, uh, and try to figure out what's it all about. And, kind of, and none of the books I read seemed to actually have a good answer. You know, so I said, I read all the religious texts and I read a bunch of philosophy books and they were all quite depressing. Um, <laughs> um, actually, when I read uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I thought, okay, this is a pretty good one. Um, you know, just to sort of try to uh, gain greater enlightenment over time, that seems like a good goal. If you don't really know what the meaning of, the, of, of life is, um, but, or even really what the right questions are to ask, but if we can uh, improve our understanding of the universe, then eventually we can figure out what the right question to ask is, uh, you know, if it's not meaning of life, it's something, you know. Yeah. It really doesn't matter whether Elon Musk is a Jew, Christian, Muslim, or irreligious. The thing that matters is that Elon Musk is a good human who is focused on saving humans by making us a multi-planetary species. Elon cares so much for humanity that he would want them to continue living on Mars in case the Earth is destroyed. You may not agree with Musk on religion, but you must admire his selflessness for humanity. Do you think Elon Musk is right in his spiritual views? Kindly share your answer in the comments section below. Thank you guys for watching. If you want to see more interesting videos on Elon Musk, click on the video right above.